In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Peace be with you. And with your spirit. Remember, remember the 5th of November. Rhymes, the folk verse recalling Guy Fawkes' foiled plot 409 years ago today. The attempted assassination of King and Parliament magnified anti-Catholic sentiment, which waxed and waned for years thereafter. When Edwin and Ruth Gould migrated from England to Australia in the 1850s, for instance, the Catholic hierarchy was just being re-established in England and this occasioned a whole new round of bonfires of Pope dolls and Guy dolls which continues to this day on this night in Britain. Edwin and Ruth Gould settled here in Parramatta and raised their eight children here. The town was on the up and up. Alongside Old Government House, the Protestant churches and the pubs, new buildings were springing up, such as the new St Patrick's Church on this site and the new jail on O'Connell Street, and both were said to draw upon the same demographic. <laughs> the next generation added even greater buildings, such as the Town Hall and the Spire of St Patrick's. Edwin and Ruth's son, Albert Edward Gould, was the government builder, and he built much of the Parramatta Hospital and schools such as Arthur Philip High. His grandest commission, still surviving, is Murphy House, beside our cathedral, where our priests vested tonight. Though Albert built the Catholic Presbytery, he was a Freemason and staunch Presbyterian who would happily remember the 5th of November and burn a papal effigy or two. With his wife Jane, he also had eight children, including Daphne, born in 1902 at their home in Rosehill Street. Daphne Gould and her siblings were presumably christened at St Andrew's Kirk along Marston Street. Astonished as these Masons would have been that their church is now a Bavarian beer hall. They'd have been even more agog that their descendant would be the Catholic Bishop of Parramatta. But there you are. Edwin and Ruth Gould's granddaughter Daphne was my grandmother. She married George Fisher and converted to Catholicism. The family were not amused and Daphne rarely returned to Parramatta. But her first grandson did as bishop. God in his providence and humour delights in such ironies. Tonight I give him and all of you my heartfelt thanks for nearly five happy years beside the house my family built. To Bishop Kevin Manning, Emeritus Bishop of Parramatta, my former Vicars General, Father Peter Williams and Father Chris Souza, Monsignor Victor, Martin, Victor Martinez, the consultors and my brother clergy and seminarians. To my fellow religious, including Sister Catherine Ryan, Congregational Leader of the Parramatta Mercies and leaders and representatives of several other religious congregations. To Mr Michael Diggs, our business manager, Mr Greg Whitby, Executive Director of Catholic Education, Mr. John Kelly, Executive Director of Catholic Care, and many other Chancery and Agency leaders, committee members and staff, my collaborators in leadership of this diocese these years past. To Dr. Jeff Lee, Member for Parramatta, councillors and other civic dignitaries. To Professor Hayden Ramsey, Senior Deputy Vice-Chancellor of the University of Notre Dame. Dr. Ryan Messmore, President of Campion College and other education leaders, 
as well as business and union officials, benefactors and friends of our diocese. And to all of you, dear lay faithful of Parramatta, welcome to tonight's Mass of Thanksgiving. Conscious of the times we failed to live our vocation as we should, we repent of our sins. Have mercy on us, O Lord. Lord be mercy against you. Show us, O Lord, your mercy. And grant us your salvation. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. that all we have and are comes down from you. Teach us to recognize the effects of your boundless care and to love you with a sincere heart and with all our strength. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the first book of Kings. King Solomon stood erect. And in a loud voice, he blessed the whole assembly of Israel. Blessed be the Lord, he said, who has granted rest to his people of Israel, keeping all his promises. Of all the promises of good that he has made through Moses, his servant, not one has failed. May the Lord our God be with us as he was with our ancestors. May he never desert us or cast us off. May he turn our hearts towards him so that we may follow all his ways and keep the commandments and laws and ordinances he gave to our ancestors. May these words of mine of my entreaty before the Lord, be present with the Lord our God 
day and night, that he may uphold the cause of his servant and the cause of Israel, his people, as each day requires, so that all of the people of the earth may come to know that the Lord is God indeed and that there is no other. May your hearts be holy with the Lord our God, following his laws and keeping his commandments as at this present day. The word of the Lord. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Colossians. You are God's chosen race, his saints. He loves you, and you should be clothed in sincere compassion, in kindness and humility, gentleness and patience. Bear with one another. Forgive each other as soon as a quarrel begins. The Lord has forgiven you. Now you must do the same. Over all these clothes, to keep them together and complete them, put on love. And may the peace of Christ reign in your hearts because it is for this that you were called together as parts of one body. Always be thankful. Let the message of Christ, in all its richness, find a home with you. Teach each other and advise each other in all wisdom. With gratitude in your hearts, Sing psalms and hymns and inspired songs to God. And never say or do anything except in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. The word of the Lord.
The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to his disciples, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Remain in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love. I have told you this, so that my own joy may be in you, and your joy be complete. This is my commandment. Love one another, as I have loved you. A man can have no greater love than to lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends. If you do what I command you, I shall not call you servants anymore, because a servant does not know his master's business. I call you friends because I have made known to you everything I have learned from my Father. You did not choose me. No, I chose you, and I commissioned you to go out and to bear fruit, fruit that will last, and then the Father will give you anything you ask him in my name. What I command you is to love one another. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Three wise men and three wise monkeys. Three angels at Mamre and three sons of Noah. Three bears and three blind mice. Three French hens and three little pigs. Three musketeers and three stooges. And in the diocese of Parramatta, three sisters and so far three bishops. Our clergy will have their own views on whether the three bishops were more like the wise men or the monkeys, the blind mice or the musketeers. 
But the received wisdom is that the best things in life come in threes. For Christians, of course, that's no accident. For we are blessed to know that God is a trinity of persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Some mystics have suggested that if we human beings are the image of God, his trinity must be reflected in each one of us, in our body, mind, spirit, or in our memory, imagination, reason, or in our deep instinct to friendship, family, communion. St. Paul was thinking this way when he taught that only three things endure, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. Faith promises us life with God forever. Hope dares strive for it. And love makes us want it more than anything. These three theological virtues are the basis of the communion between the creator and creature. And this, my dear friends, is what it's all about. The church today encompasses 1.2 billion faithful organized into 3,000 dioceses and 222,000 parishes, offering constant worship to God and service to humanity. It comprises 5,000 bishops, 456,000 clergy, 761,000 religious, and 120,000 seminarians leading and serving, preaching and teaching, praying and sanctifying. It has 130,000 schools with 51 million students, 1,400 universities, 30,000 hospitals, clinics and nursing homes, 10,000 orphanages, and umpteen welfare services. And all this is rightly about three things and three things only. Faith, hope, and love. This is what the church is for. What this diocese is for. What the bishop is for. You did not choose me, no, I chose you. God's election is called the gift of faith. And our response, the act of faith. Such faith is very evident in this diocese of Parramatta. In this very Catholic part of Australia, about a third of the population over 300,000 identify as Catholics. Our practicing rate of one in six has fallen to the same levels of which Polding complained when he came to consecrate the first St. Patrick's on this site. Though some of our parishes boast rates as high as 40%, and our diocesan average is better than most parts of the Western world today. Of course, we know many people connect with our diocese in other ways, such as through our schools, health care, aged care, welfare, youth events and other ministries. And happily, our people express their faith not just at church, but in lives of Christian leadership, service, and devotion. Above all, in making their homes domestic churches, where faith and morals are transmitted 
down the generations. But we cannot be content with five out of six of us absent. We must long for their return, reach out to them more effectively, and make sure they have hospitable and holy parishes to come home to. As Bishop of Parramatta, it has been my privilege to feed that faith by offering the holy sacrifice all around the diocese, but especially at this altar. By confirming our young people, by teaching through Outlook, DVDs, pastoral letters, and from this cathedra, and by trying my best to lead and grow and support our clergy from seminary to ordination, and then all the way to the last rites and burial. These are precious memories for me that I take with me to my new home. They are testimony to faith alive and active in the Diocese of Parramatta. This is also a diocese of great hope. Our recent expression of that hope is our diocesan pastoral plan, Faith in Our Future. After a great deal of consultation and distillation, we launched our blueprint for growing the faith and the faithful of Parramatta last Easter. It calls our diocese to inhale deeply from the sources and supports of our faith, word, sacrament, and community. And then to exhale in outreach to families, youth, communities, the connected and disconnected. With St. Peter, it calls us to be ready to give people reasons for the hope that is in us. If you consider the extraordinary number and vitality of our youth groups, the generosity of our clergy, the gifts of our lay people, the richness of our ethnic groups, the zeal of our schools, the outreach of our agencies, there are so many reasons to hope. But let me highlight just one. Every time I visit our seminary for a meeting, meal, or to interview our seminarians, I come back elated. It is medicine for the soul to get to know these young men so full of idealism, of love of God and people, ready and willing to serve. If you wanted a cause for hope, meet our seminarians. Better still, if you are free to, join up and give us more reasons to hope. <laughs> of course, such fine men don't just arrive like Superman in a space capsule from Krypton. They come from Catholic families, parishes, communities. If there are so many reasons for the hope that is in us, there is also so much potential in Western Sydney still to be realised in the building up of God's kingdom. Our Gospel passage tonight comes from another farewell Mass when Jesus took his leave from his disciples. At that last supper, he raised them to a dignity unknown in ancient religions. No longer were they servants or disciples. From that night forward, they were his friends. So when St. Luke wrote his Gospel and its sequel to Theophilus, which is Greek for friend of God, 
He was writing to us. But the ancients knew that true friendship is only possible between relative equals. For God to befriend us would require something as radical as his lowering himself to become one of us or his raising us up to be his quasi-equals. Both would be blasphemous ideas were they not precisely what God did. But that divine intimacy came at a cost. It cost Jesus everything. His divinity, his humanity, his very life, all poured out on the altar of the cross. No greater love could he show, could any man show, than that while we were still his enemies, he made us his friends. Such love redeems, heals, elevates. It chooses and teaches and sends. The best things in life come in threes. And St. Augustine said that love requires three. A lover, a beloved, and the love between them. And that, of course, is the story of the Blessed Trinity. And is the story of our diocese, too. When I think of the welcome and devotion I've experienced in our parishes, of my pilgrimages and other encounters with our young people, of fruitful conversations with pastors, lay leaders, and so many faithful, of seeing the mission of our schools signalled in the daily Angelus and strengthened by formation of staff and renewal of curriculum, of the many new initiatives of Catholic care, all these things and more are signs of love in action. But there is always more to do if we are to live, as Paul exhorts, in sincere compassion, kindness and humility, gentleness and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other. With the chasuble or overalls of love outside and the priest, the peace of Christ within. For nearly five years, I've been privileged to be shepherd under that balderkin. It's an artist's representation of the halo of the Holy Spirit descending upon the church at Pentecost and upon the gifts at the consecration. Yet this nymph glory also looks like a crown of thorns. In many ways, this double aspect, glory and gory, empowerment and challenge, are the story of the Christian life and certainly of priestly and Episcopal ministry. But I must confess that my Paramatta mitre has felt more like a halo than a crown of thorns. Whatever the travails of office, the joys have been much greater, and I have been buoyed up by your faith and hope and love. With St Paul, I conclude my ministry among you tonight with these words. I thank my God every time I think of you, praying for you with joy and thankful for your partnership in the gospel from my first day until now. 
and I am confident that he who began this good work in you will bring it to completion. with a spirit of thanksgiving in our hearts for all that God does in and through the church, we offer our prayers confident that God in his great mercy will hear us. For Francis, our Pope, for the bishops and leaders of the church, that they will be faithful to their calling to shepherd the people of God with wisdom and integrity. Lord, hear us. Lord, hear our prayer. For Anthony, Archbishop elect of Sydney, that he may lead his new diocese inspired by the gift of the Holy Spirit, and together may bishop and people advance the mission of the gospel. Lord, hear us. Lord, hear our prayer. For this diocese of Paramatta, may the gifts that Bishop Anthony has shared with this church bring about a harvest of many blessings that we may have faith in our future. Lord, hear us. Lord, hear our prayer. For the community of Western Sydney, that the church here may give vibrant witness to Christ, who is the light of the world. Lord, hear us. For all who suffer, especially those marginalized because of race, gender, or economic or social circumstance, may the church always hold fast to God's justice and never cease to be a prophetic voice. Lord, hear us. For all who have departed this life in faith, may they know the fullness of the presence of God and be drawn into the kingdom of light and peace. Lord, hear us. Lord, hear our prayer. Imploring the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary and confident that we are aided by the prayers of our patron St. Mary of the Cross, MacKillop, we place all our hopes and thanksgiving before you, O God, ever assured of your loving presence to your people, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.
Pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. For the gifts you have bestowed, O Lord, we offer you this sacrifice of praise, humbly begging that what we, you have conferred upon us in our unworthiness, we may give back to the glory of your name through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks. Lord, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God, for although you have no need of our praise, yet our thanksgiving is itself your gift. Since our praises add nothing to your greatness, but profit us for salvation through Christ our Lord. And so, in company with the choirs of angels, we praise you, and with joy we proclaim. Therefore, most merciful Father, we make humble prayer and petition through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, that you accept and bless these gifts, these offerings, these holy and unblemished sacrifices, which we offer you firstly for your holy Catholic Church. Be pleased to grant her peace, to guard, unite and govern her throughout the whole world. Together with your servant, Francis, our Pope, and me, your unworthy servant, and all those who, holding to the truth, hand on the Catholic and apostolic faith. Remember, Lord, your servants and all gathered here whose faith and devotion are known to you. For them we offer you the sacrifice of praise, for they offer it for themselves and all who are dear to them. For the redemption of their souls in the hope of health and well-being, and paying their homage to you, the eternal God, living and true. In communion with those whose memory we venerate, especially the glorious ever-Virgin Mary, Mother of our God and Lord Jesus Christ, and Blessed Joseph, her spouse, your blessed apostles and martyrs, Peter and Paul, Andrew, James, John, Thomas, James, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Simon and Jude, Linus, Cletus, Clement, Sixtus, Cornelius, Cyprian, Lawrence, Chrysogonus, John and Paul, Cosmas and Damien, and all your saints, we ask that through their merits and prayers in, in all things we may be defended by your protecting help. Therefore, Lord, we pray, graciously accept this oblation of our service, that of your whole family, Order our days in your peace and command that we be delivered from eternal damnation and counted among the flock of those you have chosen. Be pleased, O God, we pray, to bless, acknowledge and approve this offering in every respect. Make it spiritual and acceptable 
so that it may become for us the body and blood of your most beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. On the day before he was to suffer, he took bread in his holy and venerable hands and with eyes raised to heaven to you, O God, his almighty Father. Giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which shall be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took this precious chalice in his holy and venerable hands, and once more giving you thanks, he said the blessing and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. Mystery of faith. Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the Blessed Passion the resurrection from the dead and the glorious ascension into heaven of Christ, your Son, our Lord. We, your servants and your holy people, offer to your glorious majesty from the gifts that you have given us, this pure victim, this spotless victim, this holy victim, the holy bread of eternal life and the chalice of everlasting salvation. Be pleased to look upon these offerings with a serene and kindly countenance and to accept them as once you were pleased to accept the gifts of your servant Abel the just, the sacrifice of Abraham our father in faith, and the offering of your high priest Melchizedek, a holy sacrifice, a spotless victim. In humble prayer we ask you, almighty God, command that these gifts be borne by the hands of your holy angel to your altar on high in the sight of your divine majesty, so that all of us who through this participation at the altar receive the most holy body and blood of your Son, may be filled with every grace and heavenly blessing. Remember also, Lord, your servants who have gone before us with the sign of faith and rest in the sleep of peace. Grant them, O Lord, we pray, and all who sleep in Christ, a place of refreshment, light and peace. To us also, your servants, who, though sinners, hope in your abundant mercy, graciously grant some share and fellowship with your holy apostles and martyrs, with John the Baptist, Stephen, Matthias, Barnabas, Ignatius, Alexander, Marcellinus, Peter, Felicity, Perpetua, Agatha, Lucy, Agnes, Cecilia, Anastasia, and all your saints, admit us, we beseech you, into their company, not weigh in our merits, but grant in us your pardon through Christ our Lord. Through whom you continue to make all these good things, O Lord, you sanctify them, fill them with life, bless them and bestow them upon us. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honour is yours forever and ever. At the Saviour's command and formed by divine teaching, 
we dare to say. Lord, we pray from every evil, graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. Let us offer each other a sign of peace. Peace with you, Thanks, really. It's been a privilege to succeed you. Peace with you. Peace be with you. Thank you, Anthony. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. For I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof. Only say the word and my soul shall be healed.
body of Christ. The body of Christ. The body of Christ. The body of Christ. Amen. The body of Christ. The body of Christ. The body of Christ. Let us pray. O God, who have given to us a spiritual food, the saving sacrament of your Son, which we have offered you in thanksgiving, grant that, being strengthened by the gifts of courage and joy, we may serve you more devotedly and be worthy of still further blessings. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us sit. I now, on behalf of the diocese, invite uh, Bryony Mowbray to make a speech of thanks. Good evening, distinguished guests, priests and religious, family and friends of Archbishop Anthony, fellow members of the Diocese of Parramatta, visitors to our diocese, and most significantly, good evening to you, our much beloved and soon to be very much missed, Archbishop-elect Anthony Fisher. It is with great humility that I would like to thank the people of Parramatta for honouring me with the task of farewelling our Bishop. Tonight I will share of my own experiences with Bishop Anthony and the impact that his presence in Parramatta has had on my life. But I am well aware that these stories form only one part of the rich tapestry of those that could be told by so many of you gathered here. And so I thank you once again for this opportunity to speak on your behalf and I pray that my words will adequately echo the sentiments of all those in our diocese. And so, dear Bishop, on behalf of the people of the Diocese of Parramatta, congratulations on your appointment as Archbishop of Sydney. For most of us, of course, who have had the privilege of being part of this diocese, the announcement came as no huge surprise. A man with such depth of faith 
and such capacity for building Christ's kingdom could not be ours forever. And while we cannot help but feel sad for our own sake and for our diocese, we are all immensely proud of you and wish you every blessing. The first I heard of your appointment was on the radio as I drove to work. It was the morning following the announcement and you were being interviewed by Chris Yulman. As interviewers do, he naturally asked you about some of the challenging issues facing the church. I remember very clearly the eloquence with which you replied, the openness, honesty and candidness of your responses. You spoke of the many ways in which the church has positively shaped Australian society. But you also described the contemporary church in Australia as undergoing a period of well-deserved public scrutiny, even humiliation, and certainly self-examination. You said that your hope was that we'd emerge purified, humbler, more compassionate, and spiritually regenerated, determined to do better. I thought, and that's why they've chosen him. Who else but our own Bishop Anthony can speak with such authority and such pride in the church, but at the same time with such humility, and in a way that reaches out to all people, regardless of faith or beliefs, and yet so authentically witnesses to the love proclaimed by Christ. We all have great confidence in the work that God is doing in Australia through you, Bishop. And we are all so thankful that we have had the opportunity to be part of your journey and you such an important part of ours. Throughout his life, Christ gave us many beautiful images of leadership in the church, but none clearer to me than that of the Good Shepherd. And it is upon your role as the Shepherd of Christ in our diocese for almost five years that I would like to further reflect on tonight. A good shepherd leads his flock to greener pastures. He guides them along the journey and has a clear sense of where they're heading. Bishop Anthony, for so many of us, your vision for our diocese has been an inspiration and your capacity to guide and lead us together in the realisation of that vision has given us great hope in our future. I remember when I was trying to decide whether or not I wanted to be a teacher in the Catholic education system in Parramatta. I had the opportunity to ask you what you would like a Catholic school to look like, what your vision was for schools in our diocese. I was thinking you'd say something about teachers and students knowing the person of Christ and loving God, and that would have ticked the box for me for sure. But that wasn't the answer you gave, and I certainly won't forget what you said. Your reply was beautifully simple. You said, I'd like every Catholic school in Western Sydney to be filled with saints. Needless to say, I decided that that was an education system that I wanted to be part of. I'm sure there are many like me who have been guided and inspired by your vision for our diocese, a vision which you have so clearly articulated in the Faith in Our Future Diocesan Pastoral Plan. We all sense what an exciting time of faith renewal it is for us in Parramatta, and we are so grateful that part of your gift to us during this time has been the launch of a plan that has really laid the foundations for this. Through your homilies and pastoral letters, you have encouraged us to become true disciples of Christ, people with a deep love for Jesus and personal conviction about our faith. You have also challenged us to be witnesses to Christ, to share the merciful love that we have first received and given us the courage to take the message of Jesus to Western Sydney. For some men and women in our diocese, your leadership has encouraged them to embrace this challenge in a particular way through the vocation of the priesthood or as a religious brother or sister. We are so thankful to God for the blessing of these men and women and to you for your support that you have provided to make this possible for our diocese. We thank you, Bishop, for leading us to a greener pasture. A good shepherd doesn't just lead the flock, but also knows his sheep. Bishop, we are so grateful for the, t for the time you have spent with us on a personal level, getting to know us, not just as a number in your diocese, 
but really caring for us as individuals and wanting to know who we are. In this regard, I speak as one of the very privileged young people in our diocese who have had the opportunity to journey with you on two World Youth Day pilgrimages, first to Madrid and later to Rio. My memories of these pilgrimages and the time we have been able to spend with you are among some of the greatest in my life. And I can't thank you enough for your passion for the young people of Parramatta. No doubt you can remember the bishop chant from World Youth Day in Madrid, fish, fish the bish, we all wish for fish the bish. Because <laughs> who can, the Dominican, who's the man, the Dominican who heads the clan, the Dominican who's got the plan, the Dominican. What a humble and fun-loving bishop it is that lets a bunch of young co people call him Bish Fish. <laughs> I'm afraid to say that Arch Bish Fish doesn't sound quite as good, but it does still have something of a ring to it. I remember the morning that you hung out with a group of ten of us in Rio when you could have otherwise spent your time with bishops and dignitaries, far more important than we were. But that's the sort of person that you are. You're not proud or conceited, but kind and humble, willing and keen to meet people where they're at, just like our Pope does and just like Christ did. Whether it's visiting the students of the Blue Mountains affected by the bushfires, celebrating Mass with members of the St Vincent de Paul Society or married couples of the diocese, or playing tennis with one of the diocesan priests or religious, you are always willing to spend time with us and meet us in the celebrations and challenges of life. Bishop, we are so thankful that you have been a shepherd that has really taken the time to get to know his sheep. You know us and we listen to your voice. Finally, a shepherd is courageous and strong, willing to lay down his life for his flock. Bishop Anthony, as a true shepherd of Christ, you have modelled for us a life deeply rooted in a profound love of God. Your words and actions have consistently borne witness to a spiritual courage and strength that could only come from Christ. Your love of the Eucharist, so beautifully expressed in your recent pastoral message, your belief in prayer, so evident in your reintroduction of the Angelus throughout the diocese, and the depth of your intellectual and theological understanding of the faith all give us great courage. Like Christ, you really are a practice-what-you-preach kind of guy, compassionate and caring, but also firm in your convictions, prepared to make tough decisions, and willing to lay down your life for others. We only have to look at your Facebook page to see that you've done that for us for the last four years. And so, Bishop Anthony, on behalf of the flock that you have lovingly tended, thank you for being our shepherd. On the 18th of September this year, the same day as Bishop Anthony was announced as Archbishop of Sydney, Pope Francis said these words to a group of newly appointed bishops. He said, I see in you sentinels, capable of awakening your churches, rising before dawn or in the middle of the night in order to rekindle faith, hope, charity, without allowing yourselves to be lulled or to conform to the nostalgic lament of a fruitful but now superseded past. Continue to dig into your sources with the courage to remove the scales that have covered the beauty and the vigour of your pilgrim and missionary ancestors who planted the church and created civilizations. I see in you men capable of cultivating and developing God's field, in which the young sowers await hands willing to water it daily in the expectation of an abundant harvest. Lastly, I see in you pastors capable of reconstructing unity, of weaving networks, of mending, of overcoming fragmentation. May you dialogue respectfully with the great traditions in which you are immersed without fear of becoming lost and without the need to defend your borders because the church's identity is defined by the love of Christ who knows no borders. While jealously safeguarding the passion for truth, 
Do not expend your energy on opposing and confronting, but on building and loving. Thus, sentinels, men capable of tending God's field, shepherds who walk before, among, and behind the flock, I bid you farewell. I embrace you, wishing you fruitfulness, patience, humility, and much prayer. And so, Archbishop-elect, knowing the great challenge that is before you, so beautifully described by our Pope, we too bid you farewell. To continue in your great mission of building up the church in truth and love. Be assured of our prayers for you. Please keep us in yours. And may God continue to work abundantly through you in the people of Sydney. See you later, Bishfish. We now have some presentations to make to you on behalf of the diocese, uh, two in particular, and then Father Paul Marshall is going to make a special presentation to you on uh, behalf of the clergy. Now, just so long as you won't forget us all together, uh, there is one final gift. Now that you've got a new tennis racket. <laughs> If you look to your right, Jack's now going to unveil your, fav your last gift from us. Thank you, uh, thank you, Bryony, for your kind words. As a faithful parishioner and Catholic school teacher, wife, youth leader, all round good gal, <laughs> I've been very grateful to have your support and thank you for those beautiful words tonight. I remember with great fondness witnessing your renewing your wedding vows at Cana of Galilee on the way to World Youth Day and seeing Jess lift you up about four metres into the air <laughs> to kiss you. Our marriages and families and single people too, our friends, like you, are a huge part of what sustains me and my brother clergy. Tonight I give thanks to Almighty God for the time I've had here in the Diocese of Parramatta and to each of you for joining me in that. I'm grateful to our distinguished guests, including our civic leaders, whose presence betokens the ways the church and state collaborate for the good of Western Sydney. For tonight's celebration and the other farewell events, I'm especially grateful to Father Peter Williams and the farewell committee, to Father John Paul Escalan and our seminarians, acolytes and servers, and to Mr. Bernard Kirkpatrick and our excellent choir who yet again tonight excel themselves. <laughs> now,
The motet after communion really made you want to go to heaven, didn't it? It's been my privilege to serve the faithful of this diocese while delighting in their diversity and devotion, their youthfulness and maturity, their enthusiasm and wisdom. To my collaborators in leading the parishes, schools and agencies of the diocese, our employees and volunteers, religious seminarians and lay faithful, I offer you my heartfelt thanks. Tonight our diocese also bids farewell to Mr Michael Diggs, who's been our excellent business manager, and to Antoine Cassie and David Collett of my personal staff. On behalf of the diocese, I thank you for your outstanding service. To all the staff of the Chancery, and to Helen, Bernadette, Patrick and Lynn, who've served on my personal staff, another big thank you. You've backed me in the diocese through a period of growth and change with generosity and loyalty. Chief among my collaborators are, of course, my brother clergy. You are the ones teaching and sanctifying in our parishes, preaching the word and administering the sacraments, offering prayer and sacrifice to God, leading and serving day in and day out. My Vicars General, first and now Bishop Bob McGuckin, then Fathers Peter Williams and Christa Souza, have been the best of supports to me. Like the story in Exodus chapter 17 of Israel's battle with the Amalekites, these latter-day Aaron and Hur have held up the arms of exhausted Moses and ensured that the battle went well for Israel. With Michael Diggs, they have been my courier, advisers and friends, and I thank all three for their enormous personal support. I also thank my Episcopal vicars, consultants and deans for their particular assistance in governing the diocese. And tonight I'd like to honour three of these beloved priests of our diocese in particular. Father Michael O'Callaghan was born in 1942 and holds degrees in accountancy, theology and counselling. As a Carmelite, he trained for the priesthood at Yarra Theological College and St Paul's National Seminary and was ordained to the priesthood in 1976. He served as vocations and youth director, prior and parish priest. In 1987, he joined the Diocese of Parramatta and served in the parishes of Seven Hills, Lura, Richmond and Borkham Hills. He's also been a regional dean, member of the College of Priests, consultant and Episcopal vicar for clergy. In recognition of his generous priestly service, the Holy Father, Pope Francis, has been pleased to award to Father Mick the cross pro ecclesia et pontificia. Father John Boyle was born in 1945, attended Parramatta Marist, St Columbus Seminary Springwood and St Patrick's Manley. He obtained a master's degree in theology and was ordained to the priesthood in 1971 by Cardinal Gilroy. Since then he has served in the parishes of Gymea, Darlinghurst, The Entrance, Haberfield, Ryde, Castle Hill, Westmead, Parramatta, Seven Hills, and again Castle Hill. Since 1984, he's been a chaplain of the Royal Australian Air Force. As Dean of this Cathedral from 1991 to 2000, 
He spearheaded the reconstruction after it was burnt down. He's been a member of the College of Priests, Consultor, Regional Dean, and Episcopal Vicar for Chaplaincies and Pastoral Associates. In recognition for his outstanding priestly service, the Holy Father has been pleased to appoint Father John Boyle a chaplain to His Holiness. Congratulations, Squadron Leader, and now Monsignor Boyle. Father Ron McFarlane was born also in 1945. He entered the Columban Seminary in 1964 and was ordained to the priesthood in 1970 by Cardinal Knox. He joined the Archdiocese of Sydney and at its separation the Diocese of Parramatta, serving in the parishes of Ryde, Concord, Barella, Kingsgrove, Belmore, Toongabbey, North Rocks, Katoomba, and for many years now in Marion. He's also been a chaplain to the Solo Parents Ministry, Regional Dean, member of the College of Priests, Consultor, Pastoral Director of the Seminary, Episcopal Vicar for Clergy, and a member of several diocesan committees. He is currently the Chancellor of the Diocese. In recognition of his outstanding priestly service, Pope Francis has been pleased to appoint Father Ron McFarlane is a chaplain to His Holiness. Congratulations, Monsignor McFarlane. My thanks to Father Arthur Bridge and the Honours Committee for their assistance for these and all the previous awards in my time here in the Diocese. To all of you, the excellent clergy and lay faithful of the Diocese of Parramatta, thank you. You are the reason God put me in the Diocese for the past four years, ten months and four days from the day I was announced as your Bishop to the day one week from now when it will be complete. You are why God, in his strange providence, brought me back to the house my family built and to this house of God that you built. May he bless you always. Thank you. Finally, before the blessing, I, I invite all of you uh, to supper at the conclusion of the Mass. Uh, it's a very upmarket supper, <laughs> so I hope that all of you will come because uh, we think it's an upmarket occasion. <laughs> uh, and uh, just finally, I would particularly like to thank all those who have worked uh, with me for the farewell events. Uh, particularly, I want to thank your former secretary, Helen Howard, uh, who came back to work in the Chancery for a, a few weeks to help us get lists together. I particularly want to thank uh, Louise de Beck, who's just arrived back from uh, walking a thousand kilometres in the Camino and has come in and coordinated this evening, uh, and especially to my colleague, Father John Paul Escalon, and particularly the Dean, Father Bob Bassini. 
Thank you very much to all of you. Let us stand. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Bow down for the blessing. May Almighty God bless you in his kindness and pour out saving wisdom upon you. Amen. Amen. May he nourish you always with the teachings of the faith and make you persevere in holy deeds. Amen. May he turn your steps towards himself and show you the path of charity and peace. Amen. And may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit come down upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Go post the masses ended and speak to God.